the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. You know, there are many misconceptions about what the Christian faith is all about by those outside the faith. If you ask a non-Christian to describe Christians to today, you might be shocked to hear how they describe us. Oh, you're those judgmental people. You're all part of that one political party, bunch of do-gooders. Well, Christians have been misunderstood for all the history of Christianity. Imagine being one of the first Christians and people hearing rumors of this new faith where people get together and eat the body and drink the blood of the one to whom they follow. The early Christians were accused of nothing less than cannibalism. And such was the first of many misunderstandings about Christianity. And we could complain about that and worry about it, but what I'm really more concerned about at this point, at least for today, is what are the misconceptions that you and I have about the Christian faith? How do you and I misunderstand what it means to be a Christian? Among Christians of all traditions, we know that there are a lot of theologies that are official theologies that are just plain wrong. There are many so-called Christians that teach a Christianity that says if you declare your allegiance to Jesus Christ and declare him to be the Son of God, then you're saved. What you do from that moment forward doesn't matter at all. And yet, even though we know that's bad teaching, bad theology, how often do even you and I fall under some kind? We'd never say it that clearly. But by the proof of what is too often our casualness about our Christian faith, how often do we think that what we do really isn't going to matter? It's easy to misunderstand the Christian faith, especially with so much misunderstanding outside of the church that too often seeps into our own misunderstandings. Listen to the gospel that we read at the Orthodox funeral service. You've heard this if you've been to a funeral service. You've probably heard it many times in your life. It's the gospel that's going to be read over you and over me when we come to our own funeral services. In that service, we quote uh, Jesus when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And how often we hear that gospel and we find the comfort that should be found in it, and then we go and find comfort that isn't there. If we go on and read and listen to the rest of that gospel, we hear that when Jesus says that the Father has given him authority to execute judgment, Jesus says the following, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. That's the whole gospel. That's the whole teaching. That's the whole truth. A few of us that were together for our Bible study on Thursday morning were now in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. And that same judgment is referenced there. We, we studied the following verses. This is coming from the very end of the book when we're about to see what's happened over all of the tribulations and trials that go on at the end. And then we read in verse 11 of chapter 20. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Also another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. This false idea that what we do doesn't matter is not biblical. It is not Christian. It's therefore not orthodox. It's wrong. 
And when we think about the grace of God and misunderstand that grace, then we misunderstand everything Jesus is saying to us. Because he's going to come again, and as we're going to say in the creed, like we've said hundreds if not thousands of times, to judge the living and the dead. In our study of Revelation, there's really only one way to escape that. The martyrs, whose icons, many of whom you see in the church around us, they're the ones who escape judgment because their judgment came in their martyrdom as they were given the choice of giving their full allegiance to Christ to the degree of the shedding of your blood and the giving of their life, they said yes, and that's their judgment. They passed over it. But what about the rest of us? Yes, when we believe, we pass from death to life. But what do we do when we believe? That's the question. So none of us knows how our judgment is going to go. We know what's going to happen. Books will be opened, and every single thing we've done. Jesus says in another chapter that every idle word we've spoken, not bad word, not blasphemous word, every idle word, every neutral, non-good word, we're going to be judged for. And when we hear this morning's gospel, we have to wonder, where is the good news? That's what the gospel means. It's the good news. Well, there's a lot of good news. And let's understand it, but let's not misunderstand it. By the way, I'll take this moment. We'll take this commercial break for confession. We discuss confession on Thursday morning. You know, we don't use blotters anymore. I told the, the class, in the old days when you had something written in ink and you wanted to remove it, you could get a blotter with the right ink and the right blotter. You could remove what was written. The scriptures teach us, our church, our church teaches, that whatever we have done, whatever sin we've committed, that has already been written in the book. When we commit it, it's written in the book. But when we repent of each of those sins and we confess them, every single one of those sins is blotted out. The blotter comes, it's taken off, it's not there. You know, when you come for confession, one of the, the things I say to you is that I stand as a witness of all things you shall say. What's that word mean, that I'm a witness? What it means is, if anyone were to accuse you, even at the judgment seat, of a sin that you confess, I stand there and say, objection, that sin was repented and confessed. That's the power of confession. But I'm not going to speak too much about confession. That's all I want to say about today, but take from that what you will. The fact that Christ is coming back is a foundational belief of our teaching. And he's going to come back not like he came the first time, as we see in the beautiful icon of the nativity, humble and meek. He's going to come back, as we heard in today's readings, in glory. We heard that in the epistle. When Christ, who comes in glory, appears. At that point, no faith is going to be needed, either by believers or unbelievers. Everyone, in an instant, will know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the books will be opened. Now, we Orthodox are not fire and brimstone Christians. We don't focus on this all the time. And yet, I think it's important that we understand that we do believe in the judgment. And we do believe that except for those declared saints because of the witness of their life, because of how obvious it is what choice they've made, we are all going to face judgment. Listen to what St. Paul said in today's epistle after he tells that Christ appears in glory. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetous covetousness, which is idolatry. Think about that. How often do we fall into covetousness as a passing idea? It's just we all do it. Boy, it would be nice if I had that. Wish I had that. 
What's wrong that I don't have whatever the that is? And St. Paul calls that idolatry. We make a God of the things that we covet. And then he says, again, very clearly, not my words, St. Paul's, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In these you once walked when you lived in them, but now put them all away. And if you've declared yourself innocent of the last list of what he listed, here's what he says put all away he refers to. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and foul talk from your mouth. Put them all away, he says. Why? Because Christ is coming in glory. And for those who have not stated and lived their allegiance to him, books are going to be opened and everything we've done will be taken and made open. The gospel really tells the same story, but from a very different perspective. And we hear the gospel every second Sunday before the nativity. Every time it's two Sundays before Christmas, this is the gospel. <coughs> Wonderful story about a parable that Jesus told of a man who wanted to fill his house for a banquet. And he invites those who were supposed to be there. And one by one, it says they all made excuses. By the way, they're good excuses. I bought this, I have to go check it out. I've got this field I've got to go check out. I just got married. All things that maybe you and I have used as excuses when we are invited, whether it's to the church for a service or to pray our prayers or just to acknowledge the reality of God in our midst. So what does the master do? It says that in anger, he said to the servants, go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. Many are called and few are chosen. My brothers and sisters, we could misunderstand salvation as guaranteed, and we could misunderstand that salvation is about pleasing some demanding God. Both of those are wrong. The same God who invites us to the purity that St. Paul talks about in the epistle is the same God that simply wants his banquet hall full. He wants us to come and enjoy, to feast and to celebrate and to live. That's why he came. You think he came to be born in the manger so he could judge us? That's not why he came. He told us as much. He said, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world. Which is why we see in the icon, he's wrapped already, not just only in swaddling cloths as an infant, but in the burial cloth, the winding sheet with which he'll be wrapped after his passion and his death. He came to save. But just because he came to save doesn't mean that he's not going to come back and judge. We hear as much in that funeral gospel. As I hear, I just, and listen to these frightening words, and my judgment is just. You know what? You want a just judge when you're innocent. But when you're guilty, that's the last thing you want. You want a judge who is not just, who is only merciful. But our Lord tells us he's both. Yes, he's just, and yes, he's merciful. How do we know his mercy? He came. He came, he served, he taught, he suffered, he died. Why? So we could continue, as St. Paul says, as we were? No. Because he has a banquet he wants to invite us to now, to begin living the life of the kingdom now, to enjoy it now. And how can we say we're going to enjoy it then if we don't enjoy it now? We're fooling ourselves. So how do we know we're ready? Once that judgment comes, the books are opened and then they're shut. But now we have time. So how do we, how do we know? How do we get ready? Well, you do what you always do when you want to get ready for anything important. 
have a friend whose family, before they have Thanksgiving or Christmas, all the platters come out, and every platter has a name written in. This is where this goes, and the rice goes here, and the meat goes here, and the potatoes go here. Everything is rehearsed to make sure there's room. Some of you, if you're like me, you follow what's going on with our space program. We had the launch, the highest launch yet, of a new SpaceX rocket. Actually blew up when it landed. It landed a little bit too hard. But that was a practice run. That's the idea. You practice so that when the real one comes, you're actually ready. Every time we have a wedding, what do we have first? A rehearsal. We have to know how everybody's going to walk in, where they're all going to stand, what's going to happen. We rehearse everything that's important because we want to know we're ready. So how do we rehearse for the second coming of Christ? We do it in all kinds of ways. But one of the chief ways is we remember the first coming. Christmas comes to us once a year as, in a way, a dress rehearsal for the second coming by rehearsing the first. You and I weren't there in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, but many others were. And of all those who should have been ready, from Herod to the shepherds to the innkeeper to the wise men, to those who would deny even a place for the Lord he born that wasn't the feeding trough of an animal. The high priests, the people, the neighbors, of all of those, very few were ready. That silent night that we sing about with such joy was only a holy night for a very few. Most missed it, even though the prophets had come one after the other, saying very clearly, here's what you can expect. Here's how you get ready. And almost nobody was. So we were not the first, but we've been at others. Every Christmas is for us, it can be for us, a dress rehearsal. And this Christmas, should we live to see it, there's no guarantees, is another one. How we treat Christmas is our dress rehearsal for the second coming. How can we say that they're not connected? We know what Christmas is about. It's the birth, the coming of the Savior. He comes to this earth, and only once a year do we celebrate that coming. And yet, how often in the past we have treated that event more as some sort of winter festival. The lights, the tree, the this, the gift, all those, which I love, by the way. I love secular Christmas. I love it. I love everything about it. I make myself wait to start the Christmas music because I would listen to it all year long. But so little of that is a dress rehearsal for the coming of the Christ. How often are our homes filled with food and family and friends, perhaps not this year, and yet the church has so much space when we come to celebrate the coming of the Savior. So how do we get ready? How do we make this Christmas our dress rehearsal, our dry run for his second coming? Well, the, the scriptures told us. In the epistle we heard very clearly, let go. Let go of what? Let go of sin. We hold on to it, and St. Paul calls it earthly. It's what holds us down here when God is trying to draw us up, even this life, to live in the coming kingdom. And then the gospel is very clear. When you're invited, don't make an excuse. Whatever invitation it happens to be, a church service, your prayers, fasting, loving people, forgiving people, doing everything we know as Christians we're called to do. Each of those could be a burden if we misunderstand them, or they could be a gift and an invitation if we understand them properly. Every opportunity we have to go close to Christ is an invitation. Not to judgment. To a life that doesn't have to worry about judgment because we know to whom we belong. We would die for him if we were called upon. 
So if, like me, you're not there, then we have some work to do. The first invitation that God gave us of Jesus coming to save us was at that first Christmas. The Christmases we celebrated since then are in the past. And if we're given this one, let's make it what it is. The celebration of the first coming of Jesus Christ. The solution to every problem the world ever had, including a pandemic, including death from a pandemic, which only the small minority thank God suffer from. But even that, he provides a solution. Let's make this the dry run, the rehearsal for his next coming. Because we know very clearly what's going to happen. The books will be open and everything we've done will be read out loud and our judgment will be pronounced by the merciful and yet just judge. Let's say use Christmas as we can every single Im invitation to come and receive that blessing of sitting at the master's table. That's what he wants. It's why he came, it's why he was born, it's why he died, it's why he rose again, and it's why he's coming again. So let's receive these invitations to be in his joy, in his presence, by living the life he's called us to live. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.